today, 500 million years ago, aerobic metabolism sits at the forefront of the most efficient way to use energy. And so anything outside of aerobic metabolism becomes anaerobic. So if I don't have that process, that conversion of energy, I'll default very simply, and we should, to this higher stress situation of using energy. So anaerobic doesn't necessarily become a training process. It's more or less the byproduct of I'm no longer able to handle aerobically what's going on. Mm. So how quickly I can come back to that aerobic is literally how well I can. So having a very high aerobic capacity (laughs) means I function high aerobically. So when we look at people like a guy smashing the two hour marathon, what does he look like physiologically? And although there's like, look, to be totally on, like, look, I support and I'm very happy for the man and everything, but realistically, if he were in the same setup as they were in 1950 or even 1980, he wouldn't have run a sub two hour marathon. I'm joined by Brian McKenzie, the man behind Power Speed Endurance. And today we are talking about something that you will all be familiar with, but are probably doing a little bit wrong, breathing. Brian, welcome to the show. (laughs) Thanks for having me. It's going to be awesome. I'm really excited to speak about this sort of stuff today. We've been talking about endurance a lot recently. Had Alex Hutchinson, writer for Runner's World, on analyzing Elliot Kipchoge's recent performance. We've had the uh, Brian Carroll uh, from uh, Power Act Strength on talking about squatting a, over a thousand pounds, and all of this is enabled by a lot of different things. But I guess principally one of those is breath work, right? Yeah, well, physiology and I, all chemistry is regulated through our breath. So <laughs> anything and everything. I mean, I, I'm a. I, I've known Alex for quite some time. We've kind of gone. We've gone back and forth over the years. He's a great. He fucking kid man i like him a lot um i don't know your other the other guy but to squat a thousand pounds is to understand some things <laughs> he really does <laughs> he really does understand some things i mean uh kelly starrett we just released uh, an episode with him today we've had dr Stu mcgill on so you know we've had a lot of these mm-hmm. guys and when they when they talk about this even you know kelly and and Stu, people that are really really kind of at the uh, the, the top of their game very well respected within their fields it's rare that I hear someone bring up breath work. Why do you think that did is? Did Kelly? Kelly didn't. Kelly didn't. No. We were talking a bit about the Game Changers. Wow. We were talking about the Game Changers documentary and veganism. We went off on a rabbit hole down that. Oh, really? Yeah, that was wow. fun. That yeah. was fun. No, I know Ke- Kelly's very much into the bre- breath work at this point. Uh, I mean, I introduced it to him. So, uh, you know, and I know he in- he uses it inside of his uh, 101s and 102 courses now. So. Um, you know, from his work, but you know, uh, at any rate, um, Ke- Kelly's been a very close compadre of mine for a, a very long time. <laughs> uh, so we've kind of grown up in the industry together, but, uh, you know, it, it's interesting, uh, how I stumbled onto the breath work and, and why, even though I was introduced to it quite some time ago, um, and it just didn't take, and, and I understand why it didn't take. Um, because it was never explained in a way that uh, made sense to, especially a guy who was participating in strength and conditioning was all about performance. Yeah, um, I understand. So I, I, I entered into this world of yoga many years ago and had a yoga practice because I was a triathlete who was getting tight. <laughs> and when you get tight, you need to loosen up. And so I went to yoga and I ended up enjoying yoga real like a ton. And I chased around a yogi in Ashtanga, um, that was really good at what she was doing, but I just never paid attention to the fact that we were in, we were utilizing a breath practice at the foundation of this practice. Like we were controlling our breathing. We were told to control our breathing. We were told to control our breathing in specific patterns. You know, this went on and on. And I was like, you know, I, I just remember it blowing over to a large degree. And that in and of itself is kind of how we all behave to a large degree. And I'm, I'll connect all this through this talk. So (laughs) like, so that it makes sense for everybody else. Um, you know, but I largely just paid attention to the fact that I needed to get more flexible or more mobile at the time. And then I 
drifted away from yoga for a little bit, really got hardcore into endurance training, obviously wrote a couple books on that and came to a pretty good understanding of some ways to tweak things for people who were busy, um, and who were injured. Uh, you know, and that, that was a big part of my career for about 10 or 12 years. And then, um, somebody handed me a training mask and I laughed and I was like, this doesn't change altitude. I know how pressure works. I've actually worked on altitude training for quite some time and this can't change pressure pressure. So we're not talking about altitude with this thing. And, but nonetheless, you know, when you, 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 you make fun of something and if you're in, you know, done enough work in your life to understand that, that you haven't, if you're making fun of things or you're crit- criticizing things that you've never done, that's called ignorance. And I didn't want to remain ignorant to something. So I put the damn thing on and I instantly went from like, I'm seated now to I sat up. And I engaged my diaphragm and I felt my ribs expand out and like my back light up. And like, I was like, Whoa, like, you know, it was, it, it was just, I, I, I tend to feel a lot. And because of my background in teaching movement and getting people fixed or helping people to fix themselves, I, um, you know, I, I was just like, Whoa, here, Whoa, what happened? Like, <laughs> maybe we've got something that I could put on my athletes when they're warming up so that we can get them moving properly and using their, you know, their core correctly, organizing their spine in a way that it should be because, Oh shit. Like it just so happens that we organize the spine based on our diaphragm. We have to at the, at the root of who we are and what we do is a system that is dependent upon one thing. And that is life. And that life is predicated on a deal that was made 500 million years ago in order to use aerobic metabolism. So suffocation sits at the heart of that. So we could remove our amygdala, our panic, our freak out, or not our panic center, our fear center. And you will still have chemoreceptors that will set you off in a panic when carbon dioxide levels raise. So if I'm not organized correctly around my spine, I don't use my diaphragm correctly. So I default into poor breathing patterns. So this is a rabbit hole of movement that really made more sense to something about organization of the spine, right? And there's a, there's a lot of minutia around the spine and organization and core stability and everything we want to do. But by and large, we have figured out and theorized that the only reason you need to organize that spine correctly is to actually take a breath and or understand that breath because the lungs don't do that work on their own. The diaphragm is the primary in that. And then we follow up to the intercostals and several other muscles that end up getting involved, but poor breathing pattern patterns, elicit poor responses, including that of the sympathetic nervous system, or I default into some poor breathing patterns that have me using my anaerobic system more than necessary. And is that in and out and of so exercise? I, yes, that is without exercise, my friend. Wow. You are constantly using anaerobic systems and aerobic systems at, at all times. We all we're, we're like, this is, we know this. The, what we started seeing was like, look, man, we took a look back. So th- this started with a training mask. It inevitably became like, oh shit, you've got your own training mask on your face. It's called a nose. <laughs> <laughs> and holy crap. It like, it has this filter system. It's got these, this humidification system. It's got, oh my gosh, this thing mucus. Oh, it releases like immune cells. <laughs> like, um, so it helps my immune system function better. I, I spin the air differently. It forces my diaphragm to actually pull more because it's, it, it's not allowing for <sighs> fast air to happen. It doesn't mean we can't breathe through our mouth or shouldn't. It's just, when is it necessary? And we can get into that in a bit if you want, but, um, you know, it, it, it's interesting, but we, we started understanding, we started looking at the physiology behind all of this stuff and the framework behind physiology. And we've missed some big, big things. And the, it's all there. It's just the way we've taught it and the way we've looked at it has not been real. Um, I would say it, it, it's not a very creative process. Thus, why it's eluded us. And even in the world of yoga today, they've missed it and they've misunderstood what it is 
that pranayama actually means. And pranayama is a word that is basically, it's a Sanskrit word. It's probably about 5,000 years old. And there's other languages that use this, these very similar terminology, including um, Hebrew, um, that it means energy control at its root. It also means breath control. Odd that they're the same. Odd that we use a cardiometabolic device in order to measure our breath which tells us what's happening from a cellular level. So cellular respiration, we understand the only way we can me we measure that is through the gas exchange of what's going on here. So we said, let's look at this realistically and see what happens. And so we started measuring things and we were measuring things in many different ways, including just a simple breath practice um, or, hey, I'm going to go for a walk. I'm going to walk my dog. And Rob Wilson, who's my counterpart in the art of breath, who's our lead on education, he's our director of education, um, went for a walk with his dogs with his mouth open. And then he came back, reset his device, and we have portable metabolic carts, and he shut his mouth and went for a walk with his dogs, the exact same route. It turns out those are two different and totally, totally different metabolic profiles. Weird. And it's not weird. It's it's this has been said for thousands of years. We're not actually bringing we're not actually saying things that, you know, are are that crazy. But unfortunately, they are crazy in our world because there's so many really, really, really smart scientific people who we look to who've missed the boat on a lot of this stuff and the simplicity of it. And it's not that they're dumb or that they you know, whatever. It's just. We weren't really looking at this. And so we started really going after not only the movement and, 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 and how the mechanics work around this, but then the physiology, right? Um, and then starting to see that, oh, wow, it's all chemistry in the body is regulated through our breath, all of it. So how we shift from alkaline to acidic is literally governed through how I breathe. And how I absorb oxygen is dependent upon how well my body actually plays with this mole this this thing called carbon dioxide in the body in, in the blood it's carbonic acid and then as we exhale as it gas exchanges it becomes carbon dioxide but it, i am largely dependent upon how well i actually react to that and that can you know that that has other facets to it i'll go here in a second but my relationship to carbon dioxide is actually how well I play with oxygen and how well I'm efficient, how, how efficient I am at using oxygen. So I may be a free diver who can actually sit here and do breath work and be very, very, very oxygen efficient because I can hold my breath for long periods of time, which also requires an ex a very high level to CO2 tolerance. This is static CO2 tolerance. This is non-working CO2 tolerance. When we look at training or we look at human performance, and I use quotes because uh, performance, I think, is we're, we're about to kind of shift the paradigm on what human performance is. Um, but the idea that if I work, like when I start to work out, that shifts. There's a different response or there's a, uh, there's a, a very different play that happens within CO2 tolerance. And so I've been, I've been able to observe and take people who are free divers who are highly specialized or big wave surfers who are also, you know, free divers in essence mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to some degree, but they're sp highly specialized. <clears throat> and when we apply work to them, we see a very different story happen. So we see the specialist kind of come apart, right? Meaning there's a very different, like that CO2 tolerance that was really high when I'm static and not a lot of stressors going on or a big wave, so things like that. I'm very accustomed to mm -hmm. when I start working out, my respiration rate goes up considerably higher than it would with somebody. Let's say, let's call it, you know, Elioid, right? His respiration rate isn't going to go up so high, right? But the interesting thing here is I would bet if Elioid's never really participated in any sort of static breathing or carbon dioxide tolerance training. He's probably shit statically, right? And so there's this weird world that we started to see. Now, my fascination is in connection with the brain and so the neurobiology of it and the physiology. I'm I'm I've I'm now considering what. Physiology is more or less our mind, 
our ability that that's what our mind is and our ability to connect to the mind and understand the feelings and the processes and the things that are going on. And so the brain is where the circuitry and, and the information is being sent out. The brain works perfectly fine as long as we're connected to the physiology and understand the physiology. If we don't understand the physiology, the brain will get away from us and start overthinking, right? And so as kids, when we come into this world, we have this thing where we're attached to a parent and we learn and this is it's unavoidable right and and so from a neurobiological perspective at the top layer the most evolved part of the brain is our neocortex and this is where the stories this is where some of the emotional things like start to trigger but this is where the storytelling motor control a lot of, there's a lot of a dedicated area to motor control in the brain um to where we can do different tasks like i can talk or like i can talk and drink water at the same time or think and drink what, you know, you know what I mean? I mean, just yeah. simple, basic shit that we go throughout our day that some of us confuse ourselves and thinking it's multitasking of which it's not. Um, so that's the storytelling side of things below that becomes the limbic system. This is where emotions are now concrete and set up in the system and where I will have a reaction emotionally to something. And then the storytelling gets played into there. Right. And so it can get exacerbated. Then down below that we have the brain stem where or we could call it the reptilian brain, the oldest part of the brain. And this is where the kind of evolution of everything takes place. It just so happens that our respiration centers are set up in that brain stem. So meaning they are on autopilot with my system and they can respond to every emotion and every thought that I have. It also can respond to the work that I have because I have dedicated chemoreceptors set up in the carotid and the aortic valves, which are headed out to the periphery. So that means we're on a prediction system that carbon dioxide levels that are set up in my brain stem react to a prediction of what's occurring in the system through chemoreceptors and baroreceptors that are in my arteries, and it's triggering me to breathe. Mm. So my heart rate <clears throat> responds to that. Right. So the heart rate's late to the game. And so, you know, th there's a whole plethora of things in there, but how I decide to grow up and how I go through my experiences in life inevitably have a Rolodex of things on how I actually respond to breath. So when I actually am working out, I can tell with many people where the potential trauma or problems can set up, or we can see metabolic issues even from somebody who doesn't work out as they sit and are doing things. I get you, yeah. Um, one thing that's just come to me there as you were talking, do you think it's strange that we don't have control over our heartbeat as humans, as evolved creatures? Well, the only way you're going to control your heart rate is how? Output, movement? Nope. Breath? You got it. I'm just thinking because I can... So if either... I just said, hey, Chris, check it out. <laughs> control your heart rate for me right now. And if we put you on a heart rate monitor, cause that's what you, we, most people would do. They go, all right, let me get on a heart rate monitor. Like, well, no, no, no. Can you feel your heartbeat right now without doing anything? Can you feel it? A tiny, I'd have to be very tuned into my body. Yeah. 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 Took me about, it about three years ago. I was able to like, I can just sit there and I can pick it up anywhere in my body. I really want to. Or I want to do it in a toe or a finger or my neck or whatever, <laughs> right? But it's like, all right, how do I lower that? And I literally will go, and my heart rate will start to drop. I control my breathing. I understand. I think that, that obviously shows that the heart rate is um, at the mercy of the breath to a large degree. Mm -hmm. I was just thinking about whether it's, it's – I can control my breath. I can consciously mm -hmm. hold it, breathe quicker, breathe slower, but that's not something that we have with our digestive system. That's not something that we have with our heart. You know that that it would appear that from our uh, the the things that are inside of us, the lungs are kind of the only thing that we have that kind of control over. Is that fair to say, or am I missing something there? Your your breath is so. Check this out. This and this might flip your lid. <laughs> I'm ready. Your breath, your breath controls all of that. Okay, rest and digest is controlled by the breath. BKSI anger has a quote. 
he is responsible for bringing yoga to the Western world. He's one of the last great yogis. What now? He also taught things in a way that was fairly brutal. Uh, it would not have gone by where, real well today. Um, nonetheless, I, I, I'm of that school. Like I, I like that. I don't need to be coddled. I, I, I want work. I, I, and I want real work. Um, nonetheless, the mind is the king of the senses, but the breath is the king of the mind. <laughs> I like that. Okay. So that was his. It's not mine. My breathing affects how I digest things. How so? Well, my diaphragm pushes down into my organs. I have regulation of my par- I, 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 I have regulation of my sympathetic activity due to how I control my breathing. And the inhale is known as the sympathetic. And for a long time, people have said the exhale is known as parasympathetic. Well, it's not parasympathetic. It's inhibition of sympathetic. That's interesting. So exhale, that's, that's where HRV, a lot of HRV stuff gets, um, uh, wrist monitors and stuff would come from, right? It's the variation yep. within heartbeats. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And so the con- we, we started figuring out a long time ago that you could manipulate heart rate variability through breath control. Easy. So you could change a profile of an athlete who, who might not have the score or the readiness state that we want, right? And we'd apply breath work to that person and we could manipulate and then they'd have a green light. What's readiness state? What, what's the uh, characteristics that contribute to that? You fit into a specific profile. Of, so like think of a spectrum, like think, think of an arc, mm-hmm. right? Um, it, of sympathetic and parasympathetic, right? Understood, yeah. There's a specific arc with par- inside parasympathetic and slightly into sympathetic that you can be in order to be ready to train at, let's call it 80% and above, mm-hmm. right? So we would have, if an athlete fell too parasympathetic, that meant that they were literally, you know, you're dissociative, you're shutting down type of thing. You need more up regulatory things like cold plunge, like some, you know, things to kind of bring you up out of that. Mm. Um, but, uh, from the, and and there's, there's a lot more to that, but from a more sympathetic side, this is where most of us tend to fall is where we just aren't coming down enough. We're not coming out of that high sympathetic activity. That's by and large, most of the people I deal with and I see, this is the people who are probably listening to here. The overtrainers, the people that are decaffeinated, overworked. Yeah, I like coffee. I like to work out hard. I like to uh, work hard. I'm very passionate about what I do. I'm type A, you know, maybe not so type A, but I do like to train hard and do things hard and do all this. And Mm -hmm. and by and large, what we end up getting with those people is an inability to understand actually what they're training for. Like they, you know, and this is why breathing is so important is because I can actually get you to understand a lot more through that process of training and understanding your breath it's also why we created a gear system around training and how you can actually manipulate the one variable that is actually responsible for the rest of the variables that you're training for Mm, yeah that is that is right and it it does make sense that you have this direct control over one of the internal processes that's going on we have a i suppose a quite diluted control over the thoughts that go through our mind but i have a lot better control over my breath than i do the thoughts in my mind and that's after three years of pretty consistent meditation so you know i think i think yeah. focusing on the breath seems like a good place to start so if we were to do a uh, a breath mot brian where would you where would you start if you you lay someone down you're going to look under the hood you're going to look at the way that they breathe either in or out of of a training situation where do you start is it the cycle is it the I pace? Is CO, it the- co2 tolerance test I, I get a CO2 tolerance test done with them, a max exhale test. That tells me literally what's going on. Like, I mean, look, Ro- so my, my Rob, who I work with, he's in Virginia Beach, which is lo- the largest hub of um, special forces. So special warfare in the world. Um, it's where they house SEAL Team, Dev Group, SEAL Team 6. Um, you know, there's a, a, another team over there too, but there's a lot of high-level dudes over there. A lot of badasses. Um, 
<laughs> yeah, but these dudes like to train a certain way too, right? And so, you know, it, it, like you get these guys and, and they've got problems going on and it's like, all right, you know, Rob, Rob got called in yesterday for, or no, this morning. We were on the phone this morning. It was his afternoon. And he, um, it's like, yeah, I, I, I couldn't finish training. I got called in to go over to this, uh, this place to go meet this guy who seems to be a pr- pretty problematic and he's got a lot of issues and can't recover. He's got these injuries going on and blah, 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 blah. Just there's a host of shit. And he's a team guy. And, um, you know, he, Rob went over and he's like, guess what his CO2 tolerance level was. And I was like, under 20 seconds. And he said, 17 seconds. And I was like, yep, get it. And, uh, you know, he is cooked and most of us are cooked. If I've got somebody who's training like that, if I've got an operator, especially an operator who's got anything under a minute of a CO2 tolerance test, I've got somebody who's reactive. I've got somebody who their system is reactive. They may not be emotionally reactive, but there's suppression of things. I know that the tissue isn't responding well, meaning they're tight. They're probably got painful tissue. Like these things start to like compound, right? And, and they're all signs like, so, so carbon dioxide is the metabolic stress messenger of the body, of the system. Don't even need an amygdala, man. You know, so it, it tells me what's going on with the person. So if I, it's like when I have too much going on upstairs, I push that CO2 tolerance down. Right. If I'm overtrained, if I've been training too much and I haven't let my body recover enough, I'm pushing that CO2 tolerance level down. When I think, when I do too much, I'm pushing that CO2 tolerance level down. Meaning, when CO2 raises, it doesn't have to raise as much in order for me to react to it, respond to it. And the first respondent of that is your breath because I have to offload that CO2 in order to feel better. So my aerobic efficiency, capacity, threshold, whatever, switches based on how much, how, how well I tolerate CO2. It's also telling me what basically is going to be happening cognitively. So if I get a person, the first thing I'm doing with them most likely is a CO2 tolerance test to tell me exactly where they're at. It's a three-fold test. So I we you sit down for a couple minutes or you lay down for a couple minutes and you just do some slow controlled breathing that you're comfortable with. Not fast, you can't hyperventilate. Then we go into a four-breath pattern to where we breathe up for like three three or four seconds, and then you relax, let it go for about five to seven, you know, five seconds or so. So it's a little bit longer of an exhale, but let's relax, let it go. Then inhale, fourth breath, you pull it in, start the timer the moment it hits the top of the breath and you start exhaling as long and as slow as you possibly can. So you have to control it. So there's a three-part test and it tells me how much control you have of your diaphragm. On the negative, how well I have control of that. So there's the mechanical aspect of it, right? Then from a physiological perspective, it tells me how well you, how well your physiology is responding to carbon dioxide. So how aerobically efficient you're going to be just calm. Okay. Remember the dog walking the dog story? How, how well do you respond in a very simple fashion to carbon dioxide? cognitively so from a state perspective an arousal state perspective how what you how how you react to carbon dioxide so the panic switch so when you're going to be reactive how you're going to be reactive anybody below 20 seconds and we have a very reactive volatile environment that we need to actually start working to clean up and that's usually done fairly quickly with most people if And only if they're willing to actually back off a bit and learn. That allows for a gap to start to occur, an improvement to start to occur in the CO2 tolerance. So then we start to administer some breathing protocols. Hey, let's figure out, and this is why we built the state app, was so that we could actually get people some protocols to use to actually work on breath control to increase um, their CO2 tolerance, but also allow them to kind of get into this more focused or calm, clear state 
um, or downshift them prior to after training or prior to bed. That was the whole point of that. And so we'll set protocols up for people based on where they need the most help. How much of the breath control that we're talking about there is simple ability to avoid discomfort because someone who is in a good place who might feel like I can control this gas reflex for longer, that'll contribute a little bit. But as you've mentioned as well, the CO2, the CO2 tolerance appears to be like the master of this. Is that right? Yeah. So what's the question? Am I rephrasing or, or bringing that back again? So how much can be trained in terms of someone's ability to breathe that is uh, separate to the way that their physiology is put together at that time? So is there someone who's very good at controlling their breath but still might be in this? Yeah, 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 yeah. So that, that's, that's the interesting thing. And this is, why, this is where my work really diverted because I was running around with guys like Wim Hof. I was literally pretty close with Wim Hof. Um, and there's nothing like Wim's got a great thing. He's doing great work. Um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, there's other, like I've gone and participated and learned about Tumo, um, many of the, you know, yogic practices, et cetera, et cetera. Um, holotropic, um, like the Buteco, um, like there's a lot of methods out there. Right. And unfortunately, each and one, each and every one of these methods is making claims that it doesn't do in some fashion. In some fashions they do in other fashions. And th this is the problem with, you know, getting caught up in, you know, and, and understanding our attachments to things and, you know, thinking that, you know, we've got an answer and the answer is you, you're the answer. You're the only answer there is. It's not your breathing. Your breathing is not an answer either. It's just an indicator of something. Right. And so our ability, ability biologically is, 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 not even close to being tapped. And I, I think that'd be true even with something like, you know, what happened with Elioid. But going back to this is it's, I started seeing that not everybody reacts to the same protocols in the same way. Mm -hmm. And so it became a, there is not a one size fit all fits all. There's a, you know, there's a, a more or less kind of a fingerprint to some degree. And although we can bucket people and categorize them in specific ways or you know things that are going on like hey this guy is angry about stuff and that guy's angry about stuff and she's angry about stuff and you know she's more emotional and he's more emotional about things like like meaning depending on how you emotionally handle things there are going to be certain patterns that are going to set certain things off and connect you to certain things so we had to i had to start i was literally running around fingerprinting people with breath breath protocols because not everybody was responding the same way. And that wasn't a very, you know, viable thing for helping people. I was sure I was helping specific people, but I was burning myself out and there was no way I was ever going to be able to do this by myself. So build an app and build an algorithm that worked with that. And we understood how to do that. So we, we, we literally customize things to people, but then it's like, okay, well, a lot of these people like to engage in performance and they should, because you should have a movement practice. Any human being that does not have a movement practice is not being a human being. Uh, we, we are designed to move. Now, getting neurotic about that to the degree that like I have to be this specific thing or whatever, that, that's where it gets crazy. But nonetheless, applying this inside of movement, the framework of movement becomes the next catalyst in how we do things. And the base layer of that is, hey, for the first few weeks, we're gonna just be nasal breathing. You can't go anything past nasal breathing. And for most people, that's such a kick in the balls that it's like, <laughs> I don't want to do it. Like my ego is not ready for that check. And, you know, you take a power lifter that squats a thousand pounds. I can tell you right now, if they've not done any breath work, their CO2 tolerance is shit. <laughs> that's a massive, massive carbon print. You're carrying so much lean muscle, so much muscle, but you don't do, you know, most of these people don't do enough of the kind of aerobic efficiency work. And, and that's a scary word to guys like that and gals, because they think that they they're scared of a row. And it's like, that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is the thing that actually makes you survive. Like aerobic metabolism is what makes you survive. So when you're resting, you should be high level aerobic. And yet you see these guys and gals on oxygen tanks and like breathing, like, <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's not necessary. It's not, and, and it's not healthy. What's that, that due an to? Indication. 
What's that due to? See, poor, poor CO2 tolerance. Okay. And that is exacerbated yeah. by people who are high mass, high muscle mass, heavy weight. It's a car, he, look, 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 how, what's the demand for oxygen with more muscle mass? Mm. It's up higher. So yeah. I need more oxygen in order because the, like, look, like, you know, so I've got all this tissue. Well, when I don't have enough oxygen or I'm not efficient enough, <sighs> About four or five breaths in, you're going to start dipping that needle more towards those anaerobic, like, like more towards the, the 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 demand for the tissues demand for more glucose, more glycogen. Okay, the nervous system and brain are are, are stuck with glucose and glycogen. There's no there's no if and buts about that, right? But fat is what the muscles like can use. So the more fat we're using with, with the tissue, the better, right? And so the better we get the mitochondria functioning, the better off we are. And there's no reason why an NFL lineman and a gymnast or an endurance athlete can't all be aerobically efficient. It's mm-hmm. just different thresholds at which point, like, sure, the foot lineman is going to be much more of an anaerobic athlete, like much more high levels, you know, sh- you know, sprinter type explosive, You know, and so is the gymnast to some degree is, you know, pulling it back a little bit more. And then it's like, we got the endurance athlete where you're like, you know, all slow twitch. Right. And it's all the same thing in terms of efficiency aerobically. It's like, so if I've got an, if I've got an endurance athlete, who's going out on a high level aerobic ride, but they got to open their mouth. I can tell you right now, they're not as aerobic as they could be. They might be somewhat aerobic but they are not as aerobic as they could be. And they are not utilizing the system in a way that they could with it. This is literally factual things we have tested that are now going into read that, that have raised some eyebrows enough to go, wow, we didn't really look at it like this. We should really be testing this. So this is what's happening. I get it. So let's take it from yeah. the top with regards to Brian's advice for good breath. Where do we begin with yeah. that? What are the what are the principles for good breath? For, like the state app was created for this. Like, look, start in the, do one one breath protocol exercise in the morning. Do one in the evening for sleep. Play with that for a few weeks. See where it improves. What you feel, how you what what you like, what you don't. If you want to play with more, go for it. Right. That's probably going to be in the vicinity of five minutes each right? Mm-hmm. That's not hard for people who like to train morning and evening. secondarily morning and evening, right? Simple. If you want to do all four, go for it, do it. Like you're, you're getting an a plus now. Um, the second part of this is if you're not going to the world championships or you're not competing for, you know, an Olympic medal, or you're not like going to an a priority race within the next two months, you do not or event you do like there's no reason why you can't go dedicate three to four weeks to strictly nasal only breathing and take enough step back to actually get your physiology rewired across and, all and across all, all training methodologies whether you're across doing across all training methodologies power i don't lifters, care if you're an crossfit, mma athlete yeah, MMA. power lifter crossfit whatever i've done it with the crossfit athletes i did it with tia like i've done it with like I've done done it with several fucking athletes that people would never consider would do would be able to do something like this. And it rearranged what was going on and gave them an ability to do things that they didn't think they could ma- they could manage to do. And so weeks. it just empowered them in a level. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, how long does it take to create adaptation to something right around three weeks? I like it. I like that. Um, of course, everyone who is listening to State App will be linked in the show notes below Brian's app, which uh, I'm pretty certain – is this the first iteration or is it onto kind of like a 1.5 now? What's the the app? Yes. Uh, this is the first version. There's been a couple updates on yeah, it. yeah. But this is the first version of it. We're, th- there's a lot more that's going to come into the pipeline if, w- once – we get through the first investor stuff that we're going through. Uh, there will be some serious, serious things that are coming down that pipeline. Um, you know, I mean, 
it, it's already a, a, it's been way more successful than we ever thought it was going to be. Um, but we also know like there, there's a lot more that we do than just doing some simple breath protocols. Like there's high level things you can do in order to change your physiology that could, you know, that, that are game changing things. Hmm. So what happens when you breathe through yeah. your nose? Tell me. Someone's training, they're just breathing through their nose. What's happening? Why? What's what's the, we've talked about the, the different workout it, of it, the it, walk it, with the dog, yeah. with the nose open and closed. What, how, what, how's that characterized? It, it, it's your biological way of staying aerobic. 500 million years ago, cells, single cell organisms figured out how to become multicellular organisms. They said, hey, let's you and I communicate like you and I are right now. Let's talk about some things. Let's share some information so that we can pass this shit on and see, th see that oxygen rich environment now. It used to be hostile. It used to be mostly carbon. And it was, we had to be anaerobic and we changed energy other ways. And this is where like we're headed right now is this is all about energy. There's nothing else. There's nothing other, else other than energy. All energy that's ever existed has existed. It's how we're con the conversion of energy is happening. We don't, it's not, we burn, we don't burn calories. Okay. That that's us. We're converting calories. We're literally taking energy, converting that energy and then putting energy back out. Like it's literally this cycle of, and we forget about all of this thing. And so that energy deal got made when cells learned to communicate and said, Hey, let's take this oxygen and let's use this. And it's much more complex than this, but this is just the story that I like, you know, like, but it's like, Hey, 500 million years ago, multicellular organisms figured out how to use oxygen after algae and algae literally figured out how to convert sunlight into energy itself. And the byproduct of that was oxygen. So the earth became engulfed in this algae. All of a sudden there's all this oxygen in the environment. Then cells were like, yo, there's gotta be an efficient process to this. And here's that process today, 500 million years ago aerobic metabolism sits at the forefront of the most efficient way to use energy. And so anything outside of aerobic metabolism becomes anaerobic. So if I don't have that process, that conversion of energy, I'll default very simply, and we should, to this higher stress situation of using energy. So anaerobic doesn't necessarily become a training process. It's more or less the byproduct of I'm no longer able to handle aerobically what's going on. Mm. So how quickly I can come back to that aerobic is literally how well I can. So w having a very high aerobic capacity <laughs> means I function high aerobically. So when we look at people like a guy smashing the two hour marathon, what does he look like physiologically? And although there's like, look, to be totally on, like, look, I support and I'm very happy for the man and everything. But realistically, if he were in the same setup as they were in 1950 or even 1980, he wouldn't have run a sub two hour marathon. That, that wouldn't have, it's not the same marathon. It's a different marathon, even though the distances are the same, the shoes, the pacers, the, 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 the you know, all of these things exist. But I don't deny the fact that this man's physiology is off the hook. And the only reason I really know that is not only have I studied how he moves, but I've watched how he breathes. What's your analysis he of that? What's, what's your analysis of his He primarily breathing? breathes through his nose. Okay. Most of his marathon is done nose only breathing. You can find pictures all over the internet with salt marks that come down his nose and you'll see when he's running that m most of the pictures are of him with his mouth shut. Mm. I did notice that. I, so I've watched video. Yeah. Yeah. I've, wa I've, I've done video. I've, I videoed the video so that I could go and slow it down and look at it and watch it. And, you know, it painted it and it, there it is. And, you know, I mean, he comes from African culture, right? And, and what, what is of the African nose? Like they've got larger nostrils. Well, they've like genetically, they are set up to do something like if you've ever watched a horse race. So I, I watched, I watch animals like, like 
it's a, like big passion. Like I'm, I'm almost uh, neurotic about it. You know, you watch animals who don't sweat and they don't actually, the only time their mouth breathing is when they're overheating. Okay. You watch animals who do sweat a horse, a racing horse. They will not breathe out of their mouth. They just have a bit in their mouth. They breathe through their nostrils. They literally will not breathe out of their mouth. Why do we then? Because we, uh, you know, it's interesting. We have um, done real well at progressing ourselves culturally through comfort and convenience. And in that process, we've more or less stressed ourselves more than we actually needed to. So by that, I mean this, uh, there was a book written in 1867, I believe I forget the date. Um, but George Caitlin wrote a book called shut your mouth and save your life. And he wrote this book as a historian who was a lawyer from England who came over to the States, which was basically North America and South America at the time studied about a, a million and a half indigenous cultures and civilized world. He was, uh, the biggest thing he picked up on was the fact that in di an indigenous culture, they did not breathe through their mouth rarely when, and when they taught, when they spoke, they spoke with intent. They did not speak too much. They meant what they said. They said what they meant. When they slept, they slept with their mouths shut. When they hunted, they hunted with their mouths shut. They did everything they could, including when children came off of the nipple, mothers would shut the mouth of the child for fear of the black mouth. Because not only was the white eye called the white eye or round eye, mm -hmm. he was called the black mouth. And the reason he was called the black mouth is because his mouth looked disgusting. And why would that be? Well, look at what we started doing culture. Look at what we started doing. I mean, we we're drinking more alcohol. We were sugar started to become agriculture started to kick in. All of these things of convenience started to happen. Right. And here's a culture of people who play attention to nature. What is nature? Physiology. That is literally one of the definitions of nature uh, of physiology is nature origin. And thus paying attention to the feelings of nature and what's going on. So what happens when I feel when I breathe through my mouth, right? Well, I get ramped up. I turn on. I speak. If I go speak somewhere and I talk just for an hour, I'm on. Like I feel like I'm on. If I speak for an entire day, I'm exhausted. I don't go work out. I try not to go to dinner with people afterwards. Mm. Why am I so exhausted? I'm blowing off a ton of carbon dioxide. I'm more sympathetic dominant. I'm actually using less of the fat. So I'm using, I'm not as aerobic as, as I could be, even though I'm still slightly aerobic, I'm not as aerobic as I could be. Right. So it's learning those waves. They felt that shit, man. Mm. They felt it. We don't feel we, how we have these things in front of us and we're getting stimulated and we've got all these kids that are going batshit crazy because they don't have recess anymore. They're pulled from playing. They're told what to do. They're told how they're going to learn. Then they're given infinite possibilities on a machine to play games and keep them occupied because mom and dad don't want to deal with them. And then they've got anxiety because of this. They don't have anxiety. They've got proper stimulation from being overstimulated. They've got physiology that's run amok and they don't understand it. And this is by and large that what's going on with us, even those of us that like to train a lot. Like, mm. I mean, I'm on, I'm talking to you. I'm on, I need to shit when I'm done here. I mean, I'm feeling this. I feel it. So I've gotten to the point where I feel all this stuff and I'm paying attention. If I, my mouth opens when I'm asleep at night, I wake up. Why? Why would I wake up if my mouth opens? I Based don't on know. everything we, I've just kind of gone over. Because you become more stressed? Bingo. I'm now slipping more into sympathetic and I'm turning myself on. Mm, okay. I understand. How many of us are trying to sleep in this high sympathetic activity state, right? And I'm also not as aerobic. And then, oh, shit, I've got sleep apnea. So now I'm holding my breath in an awkward fashion. and <laughs> Like I've got all, like, weird. Like, 
what are you paying attention? Are, are, like, you need medication and a fucking, you need a, a, a mask to wear at night. I've got friends who do this and they refuse to do breath work. And I'm like, dude, it's your choice. Mm. I've got more DMs and P I don't even talk about this. I don't write about this stuff publicly. Like I don't go out and go, I'm going to solve your problems. No, here, start with some breathing protocols, start rearranging your training, then start feeling what's going on in your body. You're going to default to places that you can. Is it weird that George Caitlin was also in a book that I've read and the, I'm the only person who's caught this so far, right? Only because I've read this other book. It's a book called Empire of the Summer Moon, and it is about the Comanche Indians who are arguably the most war-driven tribe of people that have almost existed. They're, they're in comparison to the Mongols and like, um, you know, a lot of the stuff that happened then, but they were very, very gnarly. They were so gnarly that had the cult revolver not ended up in the hands of a few young white boys from texas called texas rangers they would have this world this country would be a very different place right now they knew how to fight off of horseback in a way that no other culture had understood and they couldn't combat it so shooting a rifle with one shot was no good right and so this book was written and there was a guy around, there was a number of historians that were there that were interviewed. And one of those historians throughout this book that was written about was George Caitlin. And so there's this guy that's there. And the biggest thing he picked up on was that the people who were of the of the earth, that were literally living on the earth, that were living in planes that Everybody feared to cross because they had no idea how to navigate. They had no idea how to do things. And there was this murderous culture of people who did not want them near anything, including other tribes. Like other tribes feared the Comanche, right? Like they were feared. And it, it, it's a fantastic read. But the fact of the matter is, is I'm able to now connect through reading physiology and then reading about literally – Hey, George Caitlin wrote this book in the sixth in 1800s about this. Holy crap. There it is. What is history? It's literally telling us what's going on. Like there's lessons to be learned about all this stuff and what people were doing. You think, you think a Comanche Indian who knew how to navigate the land could get on his horse and ride for three or four days straight with no food, basically, or limited food supply and water supply. Um, what do you think the physiology of a human being like that is like literally could survive in freezing cold temperatures, navigate land and storms? Like, where do you think we're at culturally right now? We're worried about squatting a thousand pounds and running a two hour marathon. I don't think we're anywhere close to what our biological potential is. I think we missed the boat. I think we're confused. I think we think that technology is this great thing that's going to get us into the future. And it's not, it's going to, just going to lead us right back to our own biology and going, shit, we're mimicking all this technology after stuff we internally are able to do. It's why I asked you, what would you, how, what, what, what's your heart? How do you control your heart rate? And how do you feel that? Well, I'd have to be calm for a minute and then I could really pick up on it. Yeah. Well, guess what? You can feel that at any moment you want just got to spend the time to get back to that i understand yeah it's interesting what you said there about when you spend a whole day talking right so i do coaching calls yeah. I, I coach a, a yeah. sales company in germany and every time i'm done let's say it's maybe three hours and i've been talking to these guys and it's a conversation it's at least 50 50 between me and them it's not all me but once i'm finished let's say i've done three hours four hours of, of talking a little bit of water in between a little bit of chill or whatever after i've done that i'm absolutely gassed like once I'm done I'm like oh, I'm really tired and I, I wasn't really too sure I thought well maybe it's because it, cognitively it's quite demanding I'm trying to link these things together it's because I'm really putting myself into the person I'm speaking to or whatever it might be and your suggestion here is that one of the principal reasons for this is going to be that I'm just inhaling and exhaling quite a bit of air quite a lot well you're breathe yeah yeah, you're on, right? And so you're getting stimulated, but you're getting a stimulation that you're automatically, like you're falling into autopilot on because you're talking, I'm talking, right? So we're, I'm, I'm ramping myself up. Not only am I ramping myself up and getting into what I'm doing, I'm getting focused and I'm being engaged with you, 
but the byproduct of that becomes my breath. My breath is the instant reaction to that. It, it, it's it's the first respondent. There's only two two things we can do in order to regulate or or stimulate autonomic control consciously. That is our breath and our vision. So I can choose not to look at you right now, and I can look at the end of the room, and I can go into peripheral vision, and I can downshift myself. I can go outside and look at the fucking look at nature, look at trees. Right? How many people freak out looking at a sunset? None of them. Why? Because it's math. No, it's beautiful. Yeah, beautiful's there, but that's not math. Math is the algorithm that enters the light waves that enter your eyes and open you up to go womp, and it drops you into parasympathetic. It's interesting. We've got sight. so many tools and things going on that we don't know about. Like literally, man, I was just at the Cleveland Clinic. I was in open heart surgery with them, with a team there, and they were like, "What do you think you could help with?" And it's like, simple, man. Control your breathing and control your vision when you need to. When you need to make a better decision or something, fucking the shit hits the fan. Like it's time to do that. That's human performance. That's human performance at its finest and trying to help somebody's life be saved. You know, and like why'd that person get there is another fuck, another story that we could be dovetailing back towards, hey, why we move and what we love about human performance. But that's human performance for me. Like human performance is literally getting to the core of why, you know, w- people doing everyday stuff, right? Like that's human performance. And I think we're eluding ourselves into thinking that we understand something by, you know, like what's a 500 pound deadlift do for me? It's re- these were things I had to ask myself, mm-hmm. right? Like this isn't, I'm not asking this of you. I'm a, I am had to ask this of myself. What's a 500 pound deadlift? Cause I've had a 500 pound deadlift. Right. And it's like, I, I, I was not able to connect the dots on what that meant. I don't know that that made it better for me to survive getting up off the couch or picking shit up off the floor. I, I don't know that, that 500 pounds is necessary for that. Like what's running a hundred miles doing for me. It was a fucking amazing exp- spiritual experience, but what was it doing for me? Right. And like, where was I at? And so what, what why, you know, do I need to actually run a hundred miles? No, but will I, I mean, sure. I did a couple times, but you know, like it's just like, I've done these things and I'm like, so what's the point of this? Is this, Oh, I'm now clinging to this thing, thinking it's the thing. And it, there we go. Now the mind now, now let's look at the, let's look at the neuroscience. Let's, let's, let's really start looking at the down, the up, the, how everything's compiling and what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. So when I ask people like, what do you want? Cause they'll come to me. I literally have a call after this from, with our mentorship program and I've already had two today. And it's, what do you want? And I'm pretty quick to, to understand that they don't know what they want, even though they're telling me what they want. And so it's usually like, tell me what you want. I'll show you a liar. <laughs> because we're just not ready, really ready to let, let go of all these ideas that we have. And it's not that you can't go deadlift a thousand pounds or you know, whatever. You can't squat a thousand, deadlift 500, go run a hundred miles. Like these are just extreme versions of them. Right. I don't need to go dive with great white sharks, but I did. And I got that experience and it taught me some profound lessons, man. Profound. But if I'm actually in the moment and understanding what's going on in this very moment and how I'm operating and what I feel, then I'm moving back more towards what that Comanche was doing. And I'm actually getting in tune with the vibration of how everything works and why when I go, why, you know, I went on a run earlier what I'm trying to accomplish with that run and understand about that run. Where is it that on this hill that I'm climbing right now that I have to, that I feel like I need to make this switch and how, like how cooked do I feel and where is that at and what can I do in order to improve that? So that like, Hey, this, this improves my day and it doesn't ruin my day. Right. That's what I'm taught. You know, this is where we start to, my reactions to what I'm doing in training, my reactions to what I'm doing throughout my day are the same thing but I'm just getting people closer to what that actually is. And that's what we've been doing with the art of breath is really just, you know, like people come in there and like, you know, this gal this weekend who has showed up at Rob's seminar, she was like, she's a CrossFit games athlete. And, you know, she identified as a CrossFit games athlete. I love that. Like, I I just love somebody comes in. I'm, I'm like a professional athlete. I'm a professional CrossFitter. It's like, wow. Okay. Um, 
I get it. I know where you're at. Um, you know, we're doing all this work and stuff and there's a hypoxic set where you do farmer carries with, with kettlebells, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm, so like mm -hmm. you'll do some burpees and then you go and you, we have people grab the, the kettlebells and then they dump their air and they have to walk as far as they can down and back. Okay. Right? Yep. Yep. Just farmers and, walk. And it's, and it, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yep. And, and so everybody like this chick just takes off running, man. <laughs> like she's trying to win it, you know? And one of our coaches, Danny Yeager, who's phenomenal. Um, he runs CrossFit Kingfield out in Minnesota and he's like, he watches this and then he sees a bunch of guys. So there's a lot of people there in, in the warfare community. And so there's a lot of, you know, dudes and people who are like, want to win. Right. It's like, what are you trying to win? So Danny stopped it and he goes, Hey, if you think we brought you here to actually see how long you could hold your breath while farmer walking kettlebells, you don't understand why you're here. You don't understand what we're doing. What is it you're feeling when you're holding your breath and walking these things? What's if you're trying to win the farmer carry holding your breath, what is it you're winning here there is no reward it's we're here to experience something and understand what this thing can do and teach us well i thought i was going to be able to carry those kettlebells a lot further or i thought i was only going to be able to carry them a few steps and i went further than i did awesome now we're starting to get somewhere versus oh i gotta win this like win what what are we winning that's called ego and, and you just removed yourself from understanding all purpose of, of training. All training at the foundation of training is to make better decisions under stress. Carbon dioxide is the metabolic stress messenger of the human body. Done deal. I love it. I love it. Brian, today's been fantastic. I really appreciate you coming on. Anyone who wants to check out some more of your work, where should they head? We've talked about Art of Breath. How does that relate to the State app? Is the State app a part of that? No. It doesn't. Separate. No, State app's a bit, a bit different. Um, the State app's separate. The, you know, a lot of the stuff with the business is going to change real soon. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, the whole name, everything's going to change. We're changing that. So it all kind of fit and be seamless so it makes more sense to the world. <laughs> um that being said, uh, the art of breath is a component of what we teach with inside of power, speed, endurance. It's a performance-based seminar. There's a 101 that we teach around the world, but we also have it online. So that can be found on power, speed, endurance. The state app is you can find each app, whether it's Android or iOS on shiftstate.io. Anything about me or, or if you want to get in contact with me or you know, whatever can be found on brianmckenzie.com or you can go through power speed endurance. Amazing. I, uh, I have to say it was a, a listener who recommended that I, that I check out, uh, the state app and uh, get in touch with yourself. And I think I've found the new thing that I'm going to add into my morning and evening routine. I've been looking for what it's going to be. I've stopped doing a uh, ROMWOD for the time being, and I do miss some of the breath control. I miss that parasympathetic activation. I'm still doing my meditation on the morning. I'm reading, I'm doing other bits and pieces. Stu McGill's big three, but I'm not, I'm not feeling myself in the body quite so much with that. It's very, it's very visceral. It's very kind of, um, transactional that I'm doing it for the, for the return on, on what I know it needs to do to my spine health. Uh, and I think, yeah. I think the next, I think the, between now and Christmas, it'll be, it'll be me doing that. So I'll report back. I'll keep you updated and I'll, uh, I'll let please do, know please well. do. Yeah. Look at like, I, I would do the either feel alert or be present protocol. If you're, if you're doing, doing your meditation in the morning, mm -hmm. do the breathing beforehand. There's a reason why breathing is at the foundation of every meditative practice. That's interesting. So you'd say for a lot of people that are listening, maybe we'll have a meditative practice in their morning routine. You'd say do the breath work before that, and then how how do you program that in it, on an evening? If you have an active bed? sitting, yeah. If you have an active sitting meditative practice, mm -hmm. just be clear that if you want that brought up to the next level, add breathing before that. If you want it really brought up to the next level, use the state app so that you can fingerprint your the rhythms that work with you. Like, so your app's different, going to be different than mine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
based on to you know how you actually handle carbon dioxide cognitive and, and how you handle emotional stress so that can give you an, a ramp in i can't tell you how many people who come to me who are like I, I can't meditate it's just i don't have the patience i don't have this i don't have that you're already there but it's like i show them breathing and the fact is is breathing is uh, controlled breathing is meditation literally mm-hmm. it, you'll get there it, just give it some time right so so use that beforehand in the evening anything less than two hours before you go to bed Mm-hmm. Okay. Using the fall asleep protocol, that'll downshift you and change the sleep. You'll, you should probably see some increases definitely in deep sleep, but also potentially in the REM cycle. Fantastic. I've also got uh, my new whoop band coming as the last one is, uh, has lapsed. So we'll, uh, I'll actually be able to track that and see if that's making any difference as well, which would be, which would be interesting. But Brian, today's been absolutely awesome. To the people that are listening, you already know what to do. The links to everything that we've spoken about, the state app, shiftstate.io, PowerSpeed Endurance, and Brian's website will be linked in the show notes below. Go hassle him online if, uh, if you need to get some more info out of him. Um, but Brian, it's been, it's been fantastic, man. I'm really looking forward to getting into my breath work. Right on, Chris. Thanks for having me, man. Yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah.